Thank you once again for joining us today. My name is Sin Man and I'm from the Smart Nation and Digital Government Office. So hashtag Smart Nation Together is an online platform developed to introduce your community to everything tech and most importantly, introduce digital upskilling opportunities for the community and for you to consider a career in the digital economy. So for the month of June, our theme was on smart homes. And today will be the final session on this theme. Um, thank you for following us this far. Um, so far from what you have seen or heard, uh, are you keen to introduce smart home solutions in your home, but not so sure where to start? So um, in today's session, we can find out on the things we need to consider before making our home smarter. And once again, we are very happy to have with us Lynn, our Smart Nation Ambassador and also a Principal Program Manager from Amazon Web Services to share more with us. So Lynn, over to you, please. Thank you, Simon, and I'm glad to be back here, as well as uh, slightly, let's say, 80% recover from COVID. And I know uh, many of you had it, uh, many of you haven't had it, and uh, please stay safe uh, in the meantime. Um, try to practice all of the uh, safe uh, safeguard measures that the government um, mandate. I think it is really <laughs> worth it because as someone who's gone through COVID, I said I, I would I would rather go without. So, but um, I, I was reflecting today. It's almost the three weeks that um, I've been with the the webinar series. It's almost like the developing and um, then coming of COVID, and eventually this one will be hopefully the the last of it. And, but hopefully in the past three weeks, we've got, um, we've, we've, we've shared quite a bit of useful information with you. Um, if, you uh, if you still remember, in the first one, we looked at an overview of smart homes, uh, what it was, um, how do it help us in our day-to-day -day living. Um, and we met with Alex, who is a um, evangelist of smart homes in Singapore. And if you have, um, <clears throat> you can go back to our first session to look at his video. And I fully encourage everyone to follow his YouTube channels for more idea. Um, I was looking back and remember in one of the, uh, in the last week's session, we talked about smart lock. And Alex actually did a full video on many, many different types of smart locks. So I think that would be a fantastic way for you to continue learning about smart homes after uh, this webinar series. Uh, and if you remember, Alex is very open to uh, answering questions, especially for you guys who do uh, a lot of DIY at home, right? Uh, in the last, uh, so that was what we had in the first, <laughs> in the first week, we look at what the definition of a smart home. In the second week, we look at the key benefits of a smart homes in terms of uh, especially how it for, for seniors, how it improves security, communication, comfort, and health for, for ourselves, and look at some of the um, key smart home uh, applications uh, and products out there that are relevant to, to us, especially for seniors. Uh, in this session, we will talk about uh, some key concerns as you have about smart homes, um, as well as how to um, start making our home smarter, right? Um, and uh, so without further ado, let me dive into some of these topics because we actually have quite a lot of things to cover. Uh, as Simon uh, mentioned before, if you have questions, just put in the Q&A and chat box here, and I'll make sure that I pick them up uh, as we go along, <clears throat> okay. So when we talk about um, about key concern about key concerns in 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 a smart home, what we usually see are the few uh, the four types of concern uh, that whether the device are too expensive, the vendor lock in. We stick to one of the few bigs. We stuck with a few big vendors. Whether the privacy um, is a, a big concern. And the last one is whether it, we can subject ourselves to hacker attack. Um, let's take one by one. Perhaps the leading disincentive for people resistant to home automation is the thought that it will be cripplingly expensive. Right? If you remember all of these devices and you add up and you keep looking at a home like Alex's home, it must be super, super expensive. 
but it's absolutely not the case and it doesn't have to be so right the first thing is that you got no need whatsoever to buy everything at once most people actually don't right one is just like any any home when you build when you go into a new um, a new home you don't need to buy all of your furniture at the, at the first you only need you, <coughs> sorry you only need to start with a few basic pieces and then you fill it how your home and your living style and gradually you buy one by one right so it's exactly the same in this case um, to get started with smartening your home you can spend well under hundred dollars for a home hub and this will act as a foundation of your ecosystem and help compatible devices to work in harmony with it so after that you can throw in a smart speaker like an echo device or Google Home speaker, and you've got the makings of a hand-free control at a very reasonable price. From here on, simply build and add devices as and when that fits your budget. And if you only have modest ambition for a connected home, you really wouldn't have to be spending much at all, all right? Um, the second one, a second concern then is usually whether you would get stuck with only devices from Amazon and Google. And as much as I love, you know, working as Amazon and being able to say, oh, we have so many devices, a really customer obsession um, that builds, especially for your needs. Um, it's true that, you know, we have very compelling offers out there with full system. Um, but beyond, um, beyond that, there are far more significant players in the market as well and you are free to choose your device doorbell secure system garage door uh, all of these different devices beyond the uh, amazon and google devices out there in fact uh, i would encourage you to when you look at every uh, at a device to look through in the market and see what's good um, the only key thing is to make sure that they are compatible with the system that uh, you choose, right? It's in order to uh, make sure that everything works uh, seamlessly. The third concern that you usually see is that um, there's a worry that you don't have any privacy in a smart home. And it's true, you could be forgiven for taking a very dim view of security and privacy within a connected home. Over the past couple of years, in fact, there's a few uh, instances that we see um, that can lead to such a uh, concern, but it's simply not true that you cannot enjoy any privacy in a connected home. Or yes, absolutely, you can enjoy that privacy in your home. If you're particularly conscious about this, avoid any devices with a camera or a microphone. And if you remove audio and video from the equation, you highly unlikely find yourself victim to any kind of cyber attack. As with all the aspect of home automation, if you plan carefully, then there's no reason not to feel completely safe and sound within your smart home. Okay. Lastly, um, in a study conducted by iControl, a smart home installer, 71% of consumers said that the primary concern about adopting a smart home is the possibility of a data breach, uh, that the smart home can be vulnerable to hackers, and that the threat of, uh, of them stealing, stealing your personal information. It's true, it's true that smart homes are subject to hackers, but like any other internet connected device, precautions can be taken to protect your home and the technology inside of it from attack. Which is why today I'm inviting a security expert to talk to us about how to strengthen defense against security breach of a smart home. Let me introduce my esteemed colleagues from AWS, Andrew Hodges, Senior Security Advisor from AWS. Andrew, please join us. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see from his setup that he's very serious, right? <laughs> okay. and, and, and I operate in a smart home too, so I can turn the lights off and on. <laughs> there you go. Speaking yeah. from, from his personal experience. Yeah, so right. and actually, Andrew, that, that's actually a good question. So given the fact that 75% of consumers said their primary concern 
is the possibility of a data breach. Is it true that smart homes are easily subject to hackers? I think the reality is it's it's almost like an urban myth. Um, yes, they're no more or less um, concerning, I believe, than um, than than um, systems that we've had many many years ago. And in fact, I can give you an example. For instance, um, in uh, when we I flew into Boston many 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 years ago, um, you know, like a, like a lot of large buildings, they had a, uh, a temperature monitoring system, which part of the building management system. But it was very easy if you looked at the sensor device that was out there to actually plug it in if you were a hacker and and break into it, principally because like a lot of these building management systems and the like, nobody's actually changed the default passwords from um, you know from from the actual infrastructure itself. Uh, so you know the the maintenance people have come around there. They might have installed the um, the, the environment. This is no different in a in a home. Um, if you have Singtel or Starhub or, or uh, My Republic come in and they install the, uh, the the router, do you know they've actually changed the password, or do you get the chance to change the password and and the like? Because that's where some of the breaches can ca- can occur, and many of the situations that we've seen are due to misconfigurations that people put in in place it's not really the um the the devices that are significantly at risk there's also obviously a lot of people that are concerned about um, you know privacy uh and we've we've seen you know uh, a lot of concerns raised about cameras being you know hacked and uh and and people seeing the cameras and all the rest again it's through the use of proper security controls, making sure that you know Wi-Fi is uh, is effective and uh, and it has um, you know your passwords in place that um, that you have changed the default passwords from from other areas. So yes, I, I think um, it's it's possible, but it's manageable. I like that. I like that. So. Given that, um, what are the major Achilles heels of a smart home system? Uh, among all the device, all the things that we have uh, as part, as compul- um, to make up the smart home, what are the key, the one that we um, need to pay attention the most? Yeah, look, I, I think the, 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 the challenge with a lot of these devices, and if you look at um, you know, what I've got around um, you know, my home, a lot of the devices are connected, um, you know, via um, via Wi-Fi. Uh, so Wi-Fi actually, unless you manage and control the Wi-Fi effectively, um, it uh, it is an open area. You can't guarantee that the kids aren't going to come in and um, you know and and use bad passwords in an environment that you're sharing your smart locks with, your um, maybe your Tesla power wall, your um, inverter system for your solar your lighting systems and and the like all on the same the same network the way i've controlled a lot of it is uh to your point earlier is i've chosen devices that that i pick um you know for a lot of these things if you look at say the philips hue um lineup and i use philips hue a lot throughout um you know the household to to do the lighting uh, information and 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 um, auto sen- uh, you know sensors for for walk in or motion detection and they're using uh, a a different thing than than Wi-Fi. You actually have a, a hub that goes with it, and it uses a technology called Zigbee, uh, which is a different um, a different protocol, a different um, thing. It's not just standard Wi-Fi, and um, that actually provides a little bit of segregation of your network. It separates that uh, that environment. So a lot of those devices aren't necessarily on the same uh, the same network as you have with the uh, w- with your other infrastructure, um, I've got uh, Somfy blinds um, that that I use, and they uh, they work on the Wi-Fi. Some of the door locks you would have seen in the previous presentation. Some of those are based on wireless or Bluetooth or um, or other, you know, Zigbee or other um, other technologies that are used in there. So I think with a lot of these things, it's a matter of picking the right devices for your environment to be able to still have the level of security and control. And part of that is segregating the network. And I'll give you an example, for instance, 
I have uh, my Wi-Fi uh, network here. I actually have different, um, you know, I, I have different names. Um, so I have a, a, a Wi-Fi address that is used for maybe all of my lighting systems or, you know, or other smart uh, devices. I have an IoT, you know, LAN. Um, and then I have one that I use for my general Wi-Fi. I also have a guest network in, in my house. So if I have visitors, I don't necessarily want, you know, they, they want to be able to use my uh, Wi-Fi environment when they're in the house, but I don't give them the same access as the rest of my system. So you can actually create segregation very easily, even on the, um, the, the Wi-Fi networks that are supplied. Does that help? I love that. And um, bring back to our audience who may be less technical uh, than yourself. I think uh, we will we'll definitely make sure that you walk away from this with some basic uh, tips uh, later. But yeah. um, yes, um, as, as Ed, even though what Andrews um, said might sound very difficult, I think it's actually manageable uh, and mm. it can be done in, in the, at the home level. Um, you've seen the you living in a, a smart home. Have you seen and, and have you heard of what are the frequent attacks on a smart home system? What kind of possibility out there that we need to pay attention to? Well, like I, you know, uh, we we whenever whenever we've got cameras around the place, and certainly. Um, years ago, uh, I did a uh, an ethical hacker course, and uh, you know it was surprising just how many people had cameras that they hadn't changed their um, you know their network passwords. Um, it's then that the breaches are actually occurring. Um, you know, hackers, and even you know um, people in your own home that might not necessarily be doing anything wrong. Uh, they just don't realise they may have brought in on their laptop. Mm. Some some malware that uh, that once it's in the network, it uh, has the potential to 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 breach, um, you know, other systems in there. That's actually not a deliberate attempt uh, that you would expect from from a hacker. That is just simply somebody you know walking you know your your child walking into the house that they may have come from school with some some malware on their uh, on their laptop that is now because it uses the same network inside your house that, uh, that that's breached. So there are people that really want to try and break in um, to it. There are others that, um, that, that, you know, are just doing something like a normal, you know, user would, would do or one of your children coming in. So I don't think there's any, any specifics around it. You need to understand the, the mindset of, um, of hackers. For the most part, you know, and I, I was living obviously in uh, in the sale for uh, for quite a while and Marina One for quite a while. Yeah. Um, large amounts of Wi-Fi networks um, in there. Um, did I feel inclined to want to break into somebody else's Wi-Fi network? No. <laughs> um, it's entirely possible. But, um, you know, for the most part, if you've set everything up, there's got to be a motivation to be able to do it. And I don't think there's the, the motivation for, for a lot of people to, to, to feel the need to do it. That's not to say that you don't put some controls in place for it. So I'd still get back to the suggestion about, you know, doing things like changing passwords and, and um, you know, managing it a little bit better. Actually, there's a question from our audience. Is a home firewall recommended for a smart home to beef up security? So I do, I do believe in, in firewalls, but um, without getting into too much technical deeper detail, um, I think it's good not to connect everything directly to the network without some control. So, you know, a firewall that's usually comes in the router. There will be some um, some controls in there, and I know that uh, you know with with some of the um, uh, the telcos uh, and internet providers, you can also request your own IP address, uh, usually at an extra charge. But the reason for that would be Perhaps if you have cameras and when you, you know, want to leave uh, your home um, and you want to be able to see the cameras in your home or maybe monitor what's going going on there, that should be fine. Uh, but it'll need a, um, a an IP address, you know, to be able to 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 do that. So I think there's some benefit in having those uh, those controls for sure. And most most of the um, the routers usually have some firewalling. Uh, functionality. But bear in mind, 
uh, that doesn't necessarily stop coming, you know, somebody, you know, a friend of yours or, or maybe a family member coming in, you know, and, and connecting to the, the network as per normal, it will reduce the risk. It doesn't, um, it doesn't mitigate the risk entirely. So, you know, you've got to consider other, other, other needs as well. So then what are the basic measures to reduce the risk? Um, in addition to what you've described earlier? Yeah, look, I, I think the, the additions are um, set up your firewall, um, you know, or your router so that it's, it's blocking, you know, connections that you don't need. In the most part, for instance, if you're connected to an ISP, um, an internet service provider, you're really looking at sending data out. You want to connect to web pages and the like. It's very rare that there's going to, unless you've got cameras, that you're actually going to have a need to come in. So you can actually create controls um, that are very easy to set up. And you can also, um, if you go on the web, there's actually a, an interesting website <clears throat> called grc.com, um, which um, they can actually do a, a, a test for you and tell you if you um, have a, uh, a router that is configured with no open ports or, or some controls in there so that you know that it's not easy for your devices inside to be seen. So block the traffic coming from outside to in and only allow the traffic that you need to go out to be able to have um, access. And of course, like a lot of it, it's all about set up your controls, your passwords, um, so that you um, you don't have the, uh, the the free access for it. But I think we leave you guys with some of the key basic tips yep. uh, here, just to increase security. Something that you can easily set up at home as well. Yeah. Yeah. Look, absolutely, uh, Lynn. You know, changing the, the the router's password. Like I said to you before, there have been a lot of installations done by um, you know security people that have maybe put in a you know a security uh, system in your uh, in your home. Um, they may not ask you, you know, whether they should be changing the passwords. You need to look at um, having them change passwords, and you know, jotting those passwords down and retaining them. Um, in in a secure place, obviously, uh, make them complex passwords. You know, I don't know how many people use. Um, you know, we, we've seen evidence on the web of people using one two three or one two three four five. You know, as their uh, as their password. Very common, easy to, um, uh, to 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 breach. And if you looked at um, whether it's a um, a D link um, or any of the other uh, routers, generally they come with passwords that might be admin and you know a, a particular standard password which might be just password right if you don't change that that's the way it will also be so hackers can basically look online and say oh yeah it's a d-link device therefore it's going to have this password if it yep. hasn't been changed Very true. You pre protect your publics uh, your, your passwords you know when when you're in in public you know so don't have people look over your shoulders when you're actually entering passwords in so be careful about that i think the other one which is which is down here is make sure the browsers that you're using and and look browsers need to be updated all the time uh, because there are increases in security needed for for your browsers uh, same with you know we we talk about you know windows uh, windows laptops or um, or uh, mac uh, devices you want to make sure that you're updating the um, that the firmware and the operating system you know that uh, that you have uh, there it's no different for uh, for iot devices i mean i'm using you know amazon alexa uh, devices or echo devices here um, they get updated um, automatically so there is some management but uh, some of the cameras uh, that you may have in your house, if you're using, you know, cameras, they will need to be, you know, updated from from time to time, as well. So there are those sorts of things that you need to consider. Safeguard your smartphone, um, you know, with mobile security options. And this, you know, one of those options which is fairly common is uh, and and often recommended. I know there's been a debate in uh, in Singapore for a while on on the use of VPNs. 
um, you know, for an entirely different reason. It's not a, it's not a, the, the, the debate is not around security. VPNs are actually good because it means that your device that you're actually using in say the Singapore airlines lounge or, um, or something like that may be uh, being intercepted by somebody else sitting in the, uh, in the lounge. If you're using a VPN, you, you can't see the uh, the information that's actually going, you know, over that, um, uh, you know, that network, and and that comes down to encrypted external connections. I think one of the things, and we're seeing this a lot these days, is there are uh, ways. If you if you think about um, when you go to a web browser, and you 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 get a, a, um, a URL, you know, um, you type in HTTP and then the the web www etc that's all fine but that's only an insecure environment if it's https that's an encrypted um you know channel and what's actually happening is that there are a lot of the websites now that are moving over to only encrypted you don't necessarily see it because um, you know the you might log in with HTTP, and um, but it actually automatically goes over to a, a secure channel. They're the ones that you you want to make sure um, that the uh, that the people are doing. And this, depending on which browser you're using, there's little icons up on the uh, the top of the screen that'll tell you straight away whether it's um, uh, it's safe. And I think lastly, I mentioned use different um, different yeah. networks. It was what I was talking about with things like Zigbee and um, and maybe not necessarily using Wi-Fi. I, I don't know that I'd necessarily want to use Wi-Fi on my smart locks in my home. That would be a bit of a person. Personally, that would be a risk for me. I'd probably look, like to look at other, um, you know, other ways, unless I know that my Wi-Fi is entirely, um, you know, um, protected. Uh, in the way that I've I've set it up, so I think those are some of the uh, the, the recommendations that I've had. I can't stress enough. Um, passwords are uh, one of the biggest areas um, for for a lot of this, particularly with IoT devices, smart in smart homes. Thank you for your insight. I think I, I love that it, these come from a security advisor, and knowing that you also live in in a smart home, I think will make a lot of our audience here feel secure. That that, that these recommendations, uh, aside from the security matters, what you among the the gadgets and the solutions that you use in your smart homes, what do you feel are your top three most favorite that you <laughs> like? Okay, um, so so I work on it because I've been doing this for more than twenty years. Um, believe it or not, it's been a hobby a hobby for me for, uh, for for quite some time, and I've used a whole variety of very technical devices. You know, I was on a site called homeseer.com and I used to get a whole lot of information, but I would have to learn how to program all of that. So I'm not recommending that. Since then, and and in recent times. I base my home automation on a funny term. I call it WAF. If I have a high WAF, it's got to be a good solution. So, okay, you're going to ask me, what's a WAF? Absolutely. <laughs> it's a wife acceptance factor. <laughs> if my wife is unhappy or it's hard to use, forget it. Um, and to, to that end, what I've managed to do is standardize the devices that I know are, um, are easy. So I believe... Um, very strongly in using voice uh, voice commands for, uh, for for a lot of things. So, in in my home, yes, and I you know I know that uh, that I'm an Amazonian. Um, I'm using you know Echo devices you know everywhere. Yeah. I have Ring doorbells um, you know in or in in the house um, because I know they integrate well together. But as you pointed out, uh, Lynn, before um, you know. Google's got um, you know some some good um, good systems as well. So it, it you, and and look, Apple are going to going to tell you that um, you know their their home uh, environment is just as um, worth looking at. I think you need to pick a a, a direction to make it a little bit easier. Um, but I do believe you know for me the the voice commands um, work, and I've picked devices that that I feel. Um, work really well uh, for me. There are devices that I know that will work with the Dakins, and I used to use one in, um, uh, in, in Singapore, um, and I could use voice commands to turn the, uh, the air conditioning on and off, um, change the temperatures if I want. 
um, things have changed here where, where I am because I've got a, a ducted uh, system. It's also a Dakin, but it actually has, um, when I, when I picked the aircon system, I looked for something that had, um, you know, Alexa, um, um, capabilities. And I, I look at the side of the box for a lot of these things, mm. but has Google and, um, and, uh, and Alexa support, <laughs> then I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, TP Link provide a lot of those things. I've yep. used those for, uh, for for power uh, power outlets. I use it for light settings. Um, I think I told you that most of my uh, environment has been uh, Philips uh, Philips Hue, and part of the reason, even though there's a lot of smart lights about, and I'm not, you know, saying that the other ones aren't worth looking at, I've found the reliability of the Philips Hue, even though they're, as you pointed out, very expensive, um, they they do come back to a uh, an on state the same on state if you lose power and, and those sorts of things whereas some of the others you need to need to have a, a little bit more um, effort put in i use somfy uh, blinds uh, so you know i can automate the uh, the blinds where it gets really interesting from a home automation point of view and and, and this is where the, the wife is very important um <laughs> We go into the garage and we have motion sensing lights. Beforehand, I was, you know, using Alexa to turn the uh, the lights on in the garage. Um, even that was a little bit of a problem, you know. It's certain if you're getting out of the car and you're thinking, "Oh, should I?" <laughs> um, if you had the light turn on, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so you can basically set up a lot of these skills. I've got a Davis weather station uh, here. Again, I can ask Alexa for the weather report. You know, because it's actually doing feeds and it's supported straight into the uh, into the apps. So I think that's the, the the important thing is to pick the things that you want to use that integrate um, integrate well, simplify um, the, uh, the the adoption and usage um, for the rest of the family. It might be fine for us techo people to um, you know to be able to use these things, but um, you know if the if the the rest of the family is saying this is great, that's a good thing. That's a good sign, right? That is why yeah. there's the, the wow factor right there. Uh, yeah. But on on the on that note, with various different companies and devices, how do you feel? Uh, and have you heard about the upcoming uh, smart home standard matter? Um, and whether we should looking at in terms of you know in the waiting for such a standard to to come out, uh, does that stop you from buying more more um, appliances or you think uh, that one uh, that one will be uh, more or less uh, speak to all of the things that we already have? No, I, I think I think the the smart home standard is is going to be looking at um, your devices that automatically adopt uh, you know a standard. I mean, it, it's it's not unusual uh, for you know companies to come out with new technology um, you know new technology environments. I mean, look at um, I've got a house full of Sonos speakers, for instance. Um, they've they've actually adapted their standard. If you look at the Sonos um, second series, they still work. Um, you know, the, you know, compared to the to the older ones, the standards have changed, or the recommendations have evolved out of it. So I wouldn't necessarily feel that uh, that there is a concern. I think um, you know, where standards get created, they'll probably be created as a result of industry. Um, you know surveys and industry usage to start with and i think it's fair to say that um in in the home automation uh, environment there are some various standards that are already uh, in place i mean you know uh, zigbee is uh, is one of those that's used i've had um uh, different standards called x11 that's been used some of these ones have uh, you know are probably not going to survive um, going forward, I think the ones that are currently in use now would probably be the the standards that, um, or sorry, the the devices that would actually be brought in and um, and satisfy the um, the requirements of the of the standards. But it's making those decisions um, that's uh, that that's important. I see. I mean, I think we just stand to the point that I think if as long as your um, devices that you're buying now are compliant and, and um, sort of consistent with a few bigger systems uh, like the Google or the Amazons. And I think and then the new when the new standard comes out, I think we will only continue to speak to the existing one as opposed to you having to worry about that, that you know, having to wait all the way until then. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. 
So, so just just on that point, though, Lynn, um, I think, you know, when you look at some of the standards, the standards are going to be put in place because they're trying to 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 not necessarily make sure that there's some consistency, um, which is also important, mm. but they're also going to be looking at, um, you know, making sure that there is no risk. Mm. So, if we're talking about, um, you know, technologies that are very risky, they probably won't necessarily conform to the standard. Um, I would also suggest to you they're probably not devices that you'd want to be, you know, using or selecting anyway, because you don't want to be introducing a risk into your um, into your home um, to start with. I haven't seen too many of those, but uh, but I'm sure you know we we would would have those that would evolve eventually. Definitely. Well, that's some, another tip for you to consider as you look at all of these different devices. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Wonderful. And- Awesome. Uh, so by now, the audience, you're probably wondering, where do I start? How do I get my my smart home uh, right then? And as I mentioned before, right, there's no need to buy everything at the same time right now. Um, so just a few steps. Uh, and now we'll give you the one, two, three, ABC of what to do to let's to start your 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 smart home. So the first thing, let's make sure that you check your Wi-Fi network and make sure that it's strong enough to support your smart devices. You can connect your home Wi-Fi networks and go to uh, speedtest.net, for example, from any browser and get start the test. And after a few seconds, you can see uh, whether the device is, um, is it, the, the, the speed is good enough. And typically, if each smart device in your home will use up to around 0.5 um, megabytes per second. Uh, so make sure that you have enough bandwidth to support all of them, right? Um, and then you can look into strengthening the security using some of the measures that Andrew suggested earlier. And the second step, as we mentioned earlier as well, is choose a smart assistant, which is a home hub, right? Um, <clears throat> the software that helps you control all of the smart device, right? For the Singaporean market, I usually generally recommend going with Google Assistant or its compatibility with wireless device, but also Alexa um, or by Amazon work just as well, right? Um, if you own a lot of Apple products, you may also want to consider buying into the HomeKit ecosystem to power your smart home. Though supported device are limited for now still. So you take that into consideration. Um, other alternatives include the Xiaomi Mi, Mi Home or Samsung Bixby, right? So those could be something for, for, for you to consider as well. Um, the remote access of, um, of, of these uh, devices, um, the, the network that connected device in the smart home uh, would link to a remote center, right? So, so that is the, the, the device that we, we're talking about. So make sure that um, when you look for, for these, um, Look also in the future for the different types of device that you potentially want to connect to and see there's a, um, a, a linkage uh, consistent and alignment uh, there as well. Uh, so we talked about uh, some of the of the, 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 the hub last time. Uh, I think I shared the Google, the Google set, which include the, uh, the Nest hub, which is the screen on your right here. Um, and usually you can throw in a Google Nest Studio uh, audio, which is the the speak the little speaker right to its left, and you can have <clears throat> the hub. Uh, to be honest, actually the the Nest Hub's um, speaker, which is right underneath it, right here, um, works actually very well uh, to play music. Especially, I think our bed, our living room is about what twenty square meters, and I think it. The, the the music the speakers from this NetHub fills the 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 room very well. Um, we would put one small Nest audio in every room just so that we have the speaker playing as well as the um, <clears throat> as well as the voice command function for that particular room. Uh, but I would say that's quite enough for 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 your home. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the Amazon Echo uh, is also another option. Um, and some of our, um, you can also add uh, the Echo Dot, which is a smaller speaker, 
uh, that works just as well as the uh, in, in the same in the same way. Okay. Um, so once you have the uh, hub and the voice assistant set up, then you can slowly working into adding device that are needed and fitting with your budget. Right. Um, the best one to start with are usually smart lights, and as Andrew mentioned, um, <clears throat> there the, you can get the smart lights that uh, created by by Philips, and you set up the whole system which allow you to control or turn on and off, or even change your um, movie, uh, your your setting, your ambient mood, so on and so forth. But I would also recommend to you if you want to look at specifically um sorry let me zoom ahead here um if it's really just about safety and motion sensor as andrew just mentioned in his garage right we don't need to have um a smart light system set up you can easily work with very very simple lighting that can be um with a still motion sensor LED light here, that's like the HM one, but at the same time can be um, uh, re rechargeable. Um, and in this case, let's say if you have a long corridor, you can easily uh, tape them uh, using the 3M tape on the wall. And um, every two or three days or so, when it runs out of battery, recharge quickly, it takes very, very little time to recharge, and then use based on that, um, then stick it back on the wall, right? So these are very easy way for you to set up a motion sensor lighting system without having to spend a huge uh, sum of money with the Philip system, okay? <laughs> um, we mentioned um, some of the other uh, the top device that we usually talk about um, for, for seniors, right? Um, if you look at the key things, um, the medication reminders and uh, the remote access call, both of these two can be, um, can be leveraged through the voice assistant command from your Nest Hub uh, or your Amazon Echo, right? So these can be set up. So the rest, um, if you look at what you needed, a probably biomedical monitoring device, like a smartwatch, um, an alarm system and smart locks, um, which is a little bit less, I would contend that in Singapore, a little bit less uh, urgent, uh, given how secure it is in Singapore. Um, so then the next thing you probably want is um, the, the biomedical monitoring device that allow you to track key fitness metrics, as well as, um, and I mentioned last time, I, the most important thing that I'm trying to get my parents to, 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 to adopt here is specifically for the fall detect function. Uh, when you wear a wearable device, such as an Apple smartwatch, um, and you fall, then there will be a direct um, a function that allow um, the, the watch to contact emergency uh, services as well as your key uh, emergency contact that you list on uh, your um, on your Apple system. So um, I think I mentioned last time, a friend of mine, actually his father uh, felt on the way running and the, and the watch quickly um, brought the emergency, the ambulance, to his rescue, and at the same time, inform the son uh, of the real, the life location of where his father has been taken to. So he didn't have to go immediately to the um, the location of the accident, but in fact, following the ambulance and go straight to the hospital. Right? So that kind of service is making. Um, it much easier to take care of seniors, especially ourselves. And I think that the, as we, um, as especially, and what I love about Singaporean seniors is <clears throat> you are keeping up very much with taking care of your health, of your exercise. So you're out there exercise at the HDB or uh, out there walking to the marina. 
but just make sure that you can be traced and watchable so that if anything happens, the emergency service as well as your loved ones can quickly know where what happens and follow and take care of you. So um, in Singapore, I think we have a, a, a great advantage of taking care of the system. So please, uh, by all means, leverage the system to take care of yourself, okay? Um, we talk about smart lock as well. Uh, one of the system, obviously, there are more intense, uh, more um, um, sensitive uh, and, and advanced system that you can control with your phone, which I think is quite important if um, there are um, uh, seniors with mobility issues, uh, whereby you can actually unlock your uh, your door from within your uh, from 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 inside home. Um, and this, I guess, is another another thing that we want to 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 look at is how to make sure that uh, even your loved one, your your children, would have access to some of these services as well uh, of these apps, so that they can also quickly intervene if anything's happened. Okay. Um, we talk about uh, the context, the smart contact sensor, as an alternative to to a a smart lock. So in case that um, you leave the door open, or uh, or your your children can also uh, detect uh, or, or or look at the history to see if the door has been closed or the door still leave still left um, open even when you go to bed, right? And these can also be put on the window as well to uh, to to look at the the same thing. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that you also want uh, could could also use. Uh, Andrew mentioned the um, the thermostat control um, and, and some of the remote control. Uh, this is a the Broadlink RM uh, smart home is also a very cheap way for you to connect to your um, your devices, uh, and it can it basically acts as a remote control. The same way that your remote control works for your TV, your um, um, uh, your, your air conditioner, uh, and some of the, the the devices like light, like um, so. In in our home, we have one, and it helps us control both the lighting and air conditioning as well. And it's only nineteen dollars on Shopee, so it's actually a very quick and cheap way to uh, test out and try your smart home. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I will leave you with uh, some of those tips uh, as a way for you to start exploring your smart home. Uh, if you are hands-on and you want to test and see how they actually work, I encourage you to look at some of the places with uh, smart home demos in Singapore. And I know it's a little bit small, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you can always go back to this video and zoom in some of, of these. Uh, there are many in Singapore and also uh, some of the brands like Accra also have their own showroom. But uh, some of these locations that I uh, square in red here are those with um, very high ratings. People, great, great feedback from, from visiting them. So I highly encourage you to try it out and to see how it actually works. Okay, um, so in the past few times, uh, <clears throat> in the past few times, uh, three sessions, we've covered quite a bit about smart homes. Obviously, um, these are only the tip of the iceberg. This is a field that constantly evolves, and thankfully so, right? We constantly come uh, there, they constantly come up with new technologies and cheaper technology, right, to, to, for us to, to, to adopt smart home. At the end of the day, what I want to leave you with is, um, is um, the idea that whatever smart home, uh, it need to uh, make your life better. It need to make your life easier and um, it need to work directly for you. So keep that in mind and make sure that the device that you choose are uh, reasonable, but most importantly, make your life better. So thank you very much for joining me for the past three weeks. Um, if, like all other speakers, we appreciate your feedback on uh, these sessions, but I hope that you have had uh, some very useful information in the past few times. 
So thank you again for joining. Thank you, Andrew, for, for joining the session today. And uh, we hope that everyone has some useful information. And now go off and experimenting it and make your home smarter. Thank you and goodbye.